In this video, we're going to go over some basic tips and tricks for improving the accessibility of a web application. But before we do that, let's briefly define what accessibility is and why it matters. MDN defines accessibility as the practice of making your websites usable by as many people as possible. There's a common misconception that accessibility only benefits people with disabilities, but it can actually be beneficial for a lot of different user groups, such as the older generations that might be seeing a decline in their abilities due to age, people with temporary disabilities or limitations, people using touch devices, etc. Accessibility as a whole covers a wide range of topics, but essentially it boils down to making your application understandable and interactable by as many people as possible. And that is the inherent value of accessibility. There's no good reason to ever exclude anyone from being able to use your products. By making your application accessible, you're extending your reach and potential user base. Accessibility can only ever have a positive impact on your brand and public image, and it's absolutely essential for creating a high quality and professional web app. Nowadays, it's also required by law in many cases, especially in the public sector. There are many types of disabilities, such as visual, hearing, mobility, and cognitive impairments. And this video will mostly focus on the visually impaired, specifically people that suffer from poor to no vision, that have to rely on screen readers to interpret and read the content on the screen aloud. The three most popular screen readers are JAWS, which is a commercial product, NVDA that's free on Windows, and VoiceOver that's free on Mac. We really recommend trying out one of these options just to see what it's like for users with poor vision that would like to or have to use your software. It can be an eye-opening experience, one that provides a different perspective and allows you to evaluate just how accessible and user-friendly your application really is. And we can't talk about accessibility on the web without mentioning WCAGE, or Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. It's the de facto standard and most countries use them in some way or another in their accessibility policies. The most common versions are 2.0 and 2.1. 2.0 became an ISO standard back in 2012. It is also referenced in United States Section 508, which requires federal agencies to ensure their information is accessible to people with disabilities. The US also has the American Disability Act, which applies to both the private and the public sector, but it doesn't directly reference any WCAG version. 2.1 became a W3C recommendation in 2018. It's referenced in the European Union's Web Accessibility Directive and applies to most of the public sector in the EU. This directive complements the European Accessibility Act, which applies to a lot of different services in the private sector. Both 2.0 and 2.1 have three levels of conformance, A, AA, and AAA. Each level becomes progressively more difficult to meet. For example, for version 2.1, there are 30 criteria that you have to satisfy for level A. To reach the second level, there are an additional 20 criteria that need to be met. And for AAA, there are 28 more criteria for a total of 78. To give you a simplified example, to reach level A, you cannot rely on color alone to convey information. For example, links within text can be difficult for colorblind people to see if they don't have an underline or a different font weight, for example. And for level AA, there's a criteria that states that the contrast ratio between text and the background must be at least 4.5 to 1 to ensure the text is legible. For AAA, that contrast needs to be 7 to 1. Okay, so let's get into the actual tips and tricks part. The first thing to consider is your application's layout. A typical Vaadin application looks something like this and it's commonly built using components such as app layout, horizontal layout, and vertical layout. While it's okay to use these components to achieve the overall structure that you want, you want to make sure to also use HTML landmarks for the most important sections of your application. By using landmarks, you drastically improve the user experience for people using screen readers. Screen readers are able to identify and quickly navigate between the different landmarks of an application. So users can, for example, skip to the main content of the page. We won't go through all the different landmarks in this video, but we'll briefly touch on some of the more important ones. The nav landmark, which is short for navigation, should be used for major navigation blocks in your application, such as the main menu, which should consist of a list of links. The header landmark can be used for the application's main header, commonly housing a logo, title, search bar, etc. And lastly, we have the main element, which represents the main content of the page. The important thing to note here is that each page should have exactly one main landmark. One of the simplest WCAG criteria to satisfy is to make sure each page has a title. It's the first thing read aloud by screen readers, and it helps with identifying what the page is all about. It's recommended to put the most important information first, such as the name of the page, and the company's or the organization's name second. 
This way, users are able to quickly tell which pages they have opened in the tab bar. In Flow, views are given a title with the page title annotation. In Fusion, you use the title element placed within the head block. Next up is heading elements. There are six different headings, H1, H2, all the way down to H6, and they communicate the hierarchy and structure of the page content. Screen readers are able to create an outline of the page based on the headings, allowing users to quickly navigate and scan the content. This is why it's recommended to use the headings in order to avoid causing confusion. H1 is the most important heading. Unlike the page title, it should describe the purpose of the current page. It's recommended to only have one H1 per page. It is, however, okay to have multiple H2s, H3s, etc., as long as they're used in sequential and descending order. Headings should not be used based on their visual appearance. If a specific heading is too large, then use CSS to change the font size. When it comes to navigation, you should always use router links or anchors to navigate to and between views. A common mistake is to use whatever components look the part, add a listener to them, and then handle the navigation on the server. This is not a good approach. In the worst case scenario, screen reader users won't know how to navigate the site. While buttons are picked up by screen readers, users won't expect them to be, nor are they intended to be used for navigation unless it's a submit button in a form. And when there are multiple levels of navigation, you should always give them names. It doesn't have to be anything advanced, you can simply state which level they're at, for example primary and secondary. You can use the ARIA label attribute to give navigation landmarks an accessible name. This helps screen reader users to identify the purpose of each navigation section. Input fields should generally always have a label. If a label isn't set, screen reader users won't be able to tell what the input field is for. For example, a text field without a label will be announced as edit text. But given a label, screen readers will first announce the label and then the type of input you're expected to enter. Placeholders aren't a substitute for labels, because they won't necessarily be picked up by screen readers. However, given enough context, there are situations where you can omit the label for sighted users, for example in search fields and in grid column filters. In those cases, you must set an ARIA label for the input field so that screen readers can interpret them correctly. Business applications are often specialized and require deep domain knowledge. And it can be easy, especially if you yourself know the domain very well, to assume that all the other users are experts too and know how to fill in the various forms and input fields. These kind of assumptions should be avoided, because while most might be experts, you should also make sure there's enough guidance in the application so that newcomers are able to figure out what needs to be done. You shouldn't need a manual to use a business application. So provide helpers and additional information whenever possible, because if you're not upfront about the requirements, users will most likely run into errors which can cause frustration. This is especially important when there are specific requirements that must be met or input formats that need to be followed. Tooltips aren't a substitute for helpers because they might not be available on mobile devices or to screen readers. In Flow, you can use the set helper component method if you want to use components in your helper or set helper text if you only want to use plain text. In Fusion, you can use the helper slot to set an input field's helper. Plain text, HTML, and other components are all supported. Another WCAG criteria that's really easy to satisfy is to mark required fields. In Vaadin's default theme, required fields are marked with a bullet character. You can customize how required fields are marked. By whichever approach you use, it's always a good idea to inform users upfront about how they're indicated. Alternatively, you can also put required as a suffix for the input fields label. Some also go a different route by instead marking the optional fields. This approach is commonly used when most fields are required. But whichever way you go, the most important thing is that you are consistent with your approach regarding forms in your application. It's recommended to validate user input on blur, meaning when the field loses focus. Avoid running validation during entry as it can be distracting for the user especially if they're using a screen reader which will announce the errors while they're typing. It's important to note that screen readers will not be able to pick up an error message when using on blur validation due to technical reasons. The error message will only be announced if the field is refocused. Therefore, it's recommended to use validation summaries in addition to on blur validation to ensure that the errors are read aloud. Validation summaries are usually placed at the top or bottom of a form. They should have the ARIA Live attribute set so any new errors are announced automatically. Error messages should always be displayed when a field is invalid so the user knows something is amiss. A good error message is informative and provides helpful instructions on how to resolve the problem. Additional information can also be provided when needed, for example by linking to a separate page or opening a pop-up with more detailed instructions. 
Tooltip should be avoided for displaying error messages as they aren't very discoverable. Alert dialogs should also be avoided due to their potentially disruptive effect on the user's workflow. Just like input fields, buttons should have a label whenever possible. Icon-only buttons are often ambiguous, which results in users having to do guesswork, which is not something that you want. However, there are situations that call for icon-only buttons, such as toolbars and repeated actions in tables and lists. Preferably, these buttons would then use simple and recognizable icons, such as a magnifying glass for search and a printer for printing. Icon-only buttons must have an RE label set for screen reader users and a tooltip for sighted users. R labels can also be used to provide additional context for label buttons, which is especially helpful when there are multiple buttons with the same label. And that's it, thank you for listening. If you have any questions regarding accessibility and volume, feel free to stop by our Discord or ask in Slack Overflow and we'll do the best we can to help out.